This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. First of all, I wanted to say that I, I really admire um, the film. Um, it's, I think in, in many ways it says a lot, that, um, a lot more than, than I could say in terms of the studies that have been done of hip hop and I think looking at Tupac's life, um, I think the filmmakers brought out the connections with the history, uh, particularly uh, the history going back in, in his personal history to the Black Panther Party. The film was made by Lauren Lazen, who was a former student here. Um, actually, I was her, her advisor. Um, she was in the documentary film program. And she uh, worked on, on this film as a result of her work with MTV. And uh, the, uh, the person who does most of the interviews with Tupac, uh, Tabitha Soren, is another person who was here at Stanford and actually took this class. Uh, she became a reporter for MTV and, and did a lot of the, the basic in, interviews with, uh, with Tupac. I don't know what it is about Stanford and, and hip hop, but, uh, but there's another connection. And also, uh, this is another former student in this class, uh, Chael Coker, who uh, wrote um, uh, this book, which uh, is now being made into a film about uh, um, Biggie Smalls. And, uh, and the conflict between East Coast, West Coast rap. But what I wanted to do um, is engage you in a discussion. Um, I could say a few words in terms of, of introducing <coughs> uh, this topic, but um, I really wanted to hear from you because I think in some ways this is the part of the class that deals with your lifespan and uh, what you have to say. Uh, one of the th thoughts, though, I would put forward, I guess, two thoughts. One of them is that um, one of the ways in which I look at popular culture in terms of my own writing is to um, look at a person by the name of Bert Wood. How many of you know that name? What do you know about him? Oh, no, I don't. No, I, don't no. I think she. Oh, OK. Was he a comedian? Yeah, Bert? a comedian. Bert. Oh, yeah. Bert Williams, yeah. He, he was not only a comedian, but probably the, the prototype of the black entertainer. Um, just a little bit about his background. He, um, he actually attended Stanford uh, once. Uh, another connection with Stanford. Uh, but this was way back in the 1890s, uh, when Stanford was uh, uh, just beginning. Uh, he was a West Indian immigrant who came to the United States uh, and uh, grew up in California, went to Riverside High, came to the Bay Area, uh, thought about, uh, he was a very intelligent guy, uh, thought about becoming an engineer, uh, and that's what led him to come to Stanford, but was very poor and had to drop out of school. And fortunately, he had, a, he had another talent, and and that was as a comic. Uh, he could make people laugh. Uh, and that combination of his enormous uh, uh, intellect, a well-read person, in some ways similar to Tupac uh, in the sense of, of you, you understand that the distinction between his, his persona as an entertainer is not the, the private person all the time. And with um, Bert uh, Williams, he came at a time when minstrelsy, uh, minstrelsy was the main entertainment of the United States, uh, with a long history going back into the 19th century, and uh, where white people would wear blackface and perform blackness in public. And that was enormously <laughs> entertaining to white audiences. And actually, it was such the grounding of, of, of entertainment that it became entertainment for black audiences, of black people performing blackface. In fact, when Burt Williams began performing, he's, the name of his act was Two Real Coons. Uh, in other words, these were not fake. These were the real thing. And um, 
one of the things I, I think about in terms of using him as the prototype is that <clears throat> he became the most popular black entertainer of his day. He, um, if you know anything about um, the beginning of vaudeville, the Ziegfeld Follies was the biggest uh, touring act in the United States. He was the first black entertainer hired, um, making uh, lots of money for that, that time, became an enormously uh, popular among white audiences, and um, I think established the dilemma of the black entertainer. This is all, he, his life ends in the 1920s. Um, because one of the things that has been pointed out by black cultural critics and other, you know, any cultural critic is the notion that race is performed in public. And for a black entertainer, whiteness is also performed. I mean, the, the role of the cowboy in a cowboy in Indian movies is in a sense performing a cultural stereotype and that has um, mythological meaning in American culture. Well, similarly, for a black entertainer, uh, he represents blackness in public. Now, the difference is that for white Americans with a stereotypical notion of what blackness is, that poses a dilemma for a black entertainer that is not faced by a white entertainer. Uh, you're always thinking self-consciously of the meaning of your public presence for white people as well as for black people. Are you, in a sense, harming the race um, by your performance? Um, and should that matter in the sense that it's, after all, just entertain entertainment and it's a living? It's a way to earn one's living. So Burt Williams, in a sense, became the first black entertainer who faced that dilemma. And what we can see from looking at the, the people we've discussed in this class is that by the 1920s with the Harlem Renaissance, that was becoming a major topic. Uh, during the 1930s with the rise of, of black roles in film, usually minor roles. And we were talking, um, we've talked in this class about the way in which Paul Robeson came along and performed blackness in a different way, determined not to fulfill the stereotypes of white Americans in terms of his own film, but he had to go abroad in order to do that. He couldn't go to Hollywood um, because Step and Fetch It would be the most highly paid black entertainer in, in films. Well, I mentioned that to, to provide a backdrop for where we are now. Um, I think that to some degree, there is that menstrual tradition still remains a part of, of the cultural context in which black entertainment takes place. And I think every black entertainer, whether they want to or not, has to keep in mind that cultural context. Um, whether they perform it, whether they're running away from it, they're still, it's still a part of their consciousness. The other um, thing I would point out is that during the time of Tupac's um, emergence, two important things were going on, and they involve gender. One of them is the changing role of the black male. Obviously, with the um, rise of black-on-black black black crime during the 1980s, the increasing drug trade, um, all of this provided a backdrop for the gangster rap of the 1990s. Um, that was part of Tupac's formative experiences. It's part of the formative experiences of a lot of young black males. At the same time that's going on, something also is going on with black women, which we've discussed in this class. Um, it's interesting that at precisely the time of the emergence of Tupac, there is also the uh, height of popularity of black feminist literature. So 
you have this contrast between on the one hand and black music being a forum for the expression of the um, problems and dilemmas of the black male and literature being the expression of black feminist thought. Um, it's interesting to look at the contrast in terms of the people doing it, just contrast Alice Walker versus Tupac Shakur. Alice Walker, college educated, someone who is choosing as her primary means of, of expression literature and going back to a tradition of Zora Neale Hurston, uh, Tupac also representing a tradition of ex going back to the blues in terms of expression of the <coughs> sentiments of black males. And I, I mention this in, in the sense that no artist can remain outside of the cultural context, the historical context. Uh, they might not be aware of it, but no one can remain outside of it. So I'd like to kind of throw this out for um, you and just, first of all, do you have any responses to, to the film? I think, um, uh, did you like it? I mean, is this a, anyone? Even to the point where he's like, it was like he knew he, he knew what he was doing was wrong, or like it was just like he was incredibly self-aware of everything going on around. Him. Yeah, and the remainder of the film, there's a lot of interviews that uh, Tabitha does with him, and, um, where you can sense him. It's it's almost like he knows that he's on a destructive path, but he can't get off it. That you know the one of the points he makes in the, in the film is that before he became a, a rap artist, he had never been arrested. Mm -hmm. It's only success and the role that he's pushed into, but also he wants to, to do, he wants to be that role that causes him all of the problems that um, he faces as a successful person. Yes? Um, I, kinda, I thought it was interesting how he chose Thug Life to be the name of his movement and how he tried to twist around like the definition of it. Like I remember when I was younger, I didn't know that's what he meant. You know, they don't really like show like any of those speeches that you know he gave. So like it was interesting how the media just like portrayed him as like always oh, trying to support violence and. and uh, so, so when you were growing up, how did how did you think about him? Him, I thought he was you know. He was like real, he was like a gangster, he was like real into like, you know, crime and, and things like that, but I thought it was, I don't know if I was cool, maybe when I was younger, and I couldn't do things like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, one of, one of the things that comes through is his intelligence. I mean, he's just really a bright guy. And, uh, go ahead, yeah. I guess it's just, <clears throat> I'm actually a fan of his, but it's, um, it's hard for me to reconcile all the, the positive songs and commentary that he has with the more dramatically, like, I guess, antisocial parts of his life, or sociopathic, or whatever you want, whatever you want to refer to it as. Because he's very purposeful, it seems, in what he does. Like, like you said, he's a very intelligent person, so like the impact of these other things, like, they showed the positive songs, for example, but then there are a lot of misogynistic lyrics in his other songs that weren't shown in the, in the documentary. And it's like, how do you, like, does your good music compensate yeah, for that? How do you reconcile that with his, his own self-professed, he understands women? Yeah. That's something that came out really strong in the interviews was um, how conscious he was of how confused and unable or not mature enough to handle a movement of that size. Um, he felt that it was getting bigger than him, and just uh, like I mean, I think that deals to um, you know those two sides of him uh, and how he's portrayed, and, and not knowing how he got himself stuck in a corner like that, but then also not really knowing how to get out of it um, because he has this uh, this mission in his mind, what his music's supposed to do, and what he wants to say to the public, and yet the public image of him is is certainly not the same. I don't think, so. It was really nice to see his, his consciousness of that.
Yeah, one of the things I've done for next month for the King holiday celebration is invite Common to come here. And uh, he's set up a foundation now in San Francisco um, to try to do, try to deal with some of the, the issues. Uh, so, you know, the, that notion of socially conscious, but he's facing the same kind of dilemmas that, that Tupac face in terms of the pressures to, uh, you know, to make, uh, to make it big in the industry. Yeah. I'm just wondering, just to broaden the perspective a little bit in terms of this discussion, um, what's the most popular dramatic movie in America today? American Gangster. American Gangster. Um, so what? <laughs> uh, so what does that mean? Is, is it, how many of you have seen that film? Okay. Um, it's kind of it's it's interesting in that this is a time when dramatic films are not attracting big audiences. Most of them are either animated comedies or whatever. Um, and but the only one that really has made money has been American Gangster. So does that what does that suggest in, in terms of what I was putting forward in terms of performing blackness? Um, what is it? Are we past that? Do we do, shouldn't worry about it anymore when Denzel Washington as a very charismatic actor can uh, can can really attract large numbers of white and black people to the movie theaters to see uh, a black drug dealer. Now, is the film? What's the point of the film? Is it is it to show that that's bad, or is it to show that that's heroic? Um, he's fighting against the system, you know, whatever. Well, I think that <clears throat> I've heard a lot of people call it like, the next Scarface, and it, in, in Scarface's case, like it's dictated a lot to um, to Latin culture and, and to young kids who watch it, uh, because it's not just adults. If you read it, read it hard, people like kids are going to see it too. And that's who gets affected the most uh, without really getting the plot line and like how the story ends. So some of the stuff like that he does in the movie, um, that Denzel pulls off or whatever, that can be termed as, as pretty glamorous if you're if you're looking for that kind of a of a thrill, I guess. And like if a young kid's watching it or or even like high schoolers or whatever, like if you don't sit through the whole thing and you don't see like the demise, if you don't really get that, then you're still coming away with something that's perpetuating what we're talking about already. I think people just like the idea of the gangster life, even if you know nothing about it and you didn't actually grow up in that kind of lifestyle, the, the name just attracts people. I was even watching this interview with Denzel Washington and he was talking about he's never gotten that kind of reaction from a, a film in his whole <coughs> career. Which is, he's like my favorite actor in the whole world. So, and I, you know, he had me at Malcolm X, but it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy that the American Gangster is the one that like everyone is talking about in terms of like the like, highlight of, or like the pinnacle of his career. And he was even saying that like he's worried that I saw this kind of like years ago, and he's worried that like people will take away not what he wanted people to take away out of the film because the film isn't to glorify that lifestyle. <coughs> And so, um, and even like Jay Z, like naming his album American Gangster, like everyone's kind of like capitalizing off the title and like what that like may signify, but not actually like realizing that these, this is not what um, the filmmakers were trying to do. And like we, you were saying, if you watch the film, it's not glorifying that lifestyle because Frank Lucas like went down in a big way. Um, but yeah, it, there's a lot of, you know, gun carrying and, and shooting people on the streets and people may walk away being like, oh, that's really cool, but I don't think that's what the filmmakers intended. It's certainly not. Well, did it go down in a really big way? I, mean, I, least, you know, I think so. I don't. I don't. I mean, I, I think that... I mean, uh, how many people in, in the world would give up, you know, what is it, 10 to 15 years of your life? To yeah, it ended up being like 15 years, I think. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that the movie... I mean, obviously we understand, you know what I mean? But I don't know that the movie made a, a good enough point of like sort of showing that, that what he was doing was wrong, so to speak. And at the same time, well, how do you how do you insert that if it's based on a true story? And like maybe he really, you know, maybe it wasn't, the, t the deterioration wasn't as dramatic as that would require, you know? So. Yeah, one, one thing that Denzel said is that um, 
the model for the movie was The Godfather. I mean, if you, if you think... If you think back to The Godfather, it's the same thing. The police are corrupt, too. This is our way of making it in American society, uh, that this is, uh, this is just the route that's been open to us. We're, we're taking the world as it, as it exists. Yeah, I think that the point of the movie was to highlight what Germain was talking about, and also to, I think that they really marketed the Frank Lucas character as someone who was innovative. And I think that that was what they were trying to get across, not that he was I don't think it was judging him as good or bad, but as, like, innovative. Because he really did something that hadn't been done before. And that's one of the things that they were trying to highlight in the film. Well, that a black person hadn't black done before. Yeah. 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 Yes. One of, one of the things that is kind of hinted at the, in the film, but not really developed because it's a different film, it's more about what happens in the United States, is that um, Part of the background for the film is a series of articles that actually appeared in the San Jose Mercury um, a number of years back about the origins of the drug trade, tra tra tracking it back to the Vietnam War and the kinds of, of deals that were basically made by the CIA to allow the drug trade in order to finance part of the war and um, that we're kind of getting the blowback from that, you know, today. That, uh, in, in fact, all the years since then, of all of this encouragement of poppy fields in places like um, Afghanistan um, that uh, are now coming back to, to haunt us and, and it's still there, and all the destruction that happened in American society as, a, as the result of these political decisions about what to. You know, what, what had priority? Was it the Cold War or the war on drugs? And it was quite clear that the Cold War took precedence over the, the war on drugs with respect to um, alliances we made outside the United States. Now, that's, that's an important story to tell. And it, and it actually was a quite controversial when the Mercury News tried to tell that story because they actually um, showed some of the you know, had documentation of some of the connections there. Um, but, um, and even today, most people are not willing to accept that story. Uh, but it is, it is an important aspect of kind of getting away from the notion that the drug wars of the 1980s was just, well, it just happened. You know, it just kind of came out of nowhere um, that these, these um, were not the result of decisions. I think someone else had a, yeah. yeah. Well, again, kind of taking a broader, broader view, what's, what is the answer to that, pro that question that was raised in the 1920s? Uh, Langston Hughes tries to answer it. Um, you know, what is the role of the black artist raised by uh, Du Bois and, and many others? Does the black artist have any special responsibility? Is, th is this something that um, is culture and especially entertainment? Uh, when we're talking about artists, uh, I think Tupac is an artist. Other people I would define as performers. That they're, they're not really the creative agent creating what they are performing. They're simply going out and performing it, and they're doing it for money. Uh, so should should there be any responsibility? You know, they're just earning a living. They're good singers. They're good dancers. They're, you know, whatever. Uh, why shouldn't they be able to make a living like everyone else? Without uh, does someone question uh, someone who goes to work for a law firm and defends drug dealers? You know, somebody's got to do it, and it makes money. But why should there be any any greater social responsibility for an artist, entertainer, as opposed to anyone else in society. Yes? I mean, I think it's fine to, to expect from anyone in the, in the public sphere to be responsible with their behavior. Um, and I think that, especially for those who presume to, be, to, to I don't know, wield some greater amount of self-righteousness, like I feel he kind of did. Um, as sort of the self-proclaimed like 
<coughs> voice for you know a large marginalized community that it's like the, that the onus is on him to you know really be intentional with what he produces and what people are going to okay well let, let me pose it in another way um, there's been a lot of criticism about the depiction of black women particularly in in rap videos it, who should bury the responsibility? The black women who dance or the people who create the video? You know, what's, what, how, how, do you, how do you assign responsibility? I didn't know whether you wanted to. Uh, no, I mean, I was gonna, I'm kind of adding to that image of, of black women in dancing videos. My kind of question was with like sitcoms or like movies, um, there's like a specific genre of, you know, like of movies that depict like the black family in a certain way or like of sitcoms that are on TV that depict black women or black families in a certain, in a certain light um, that like continue, and it's kind of a similar story we made over and over and I was kind of wondering what people's like, opinions were on, on that as well. And then I think we also, as the audience, have to take responsibility of what we're actually watching. Like, I know that like, Soldier Boys video, like Crank That right now, it's like everybody does that at the dances, and like if you're at all the parties, everybody's gonna crank that. But it's like the song is hugely misogynistic. It's like disgusting when you think about what he's actually saying. But still, my, I myself, I'm, I know I'm out there doing it too. But what is my responsibility as a woman who doesn't want to portray these misogynistic roles? Like, what is my responsibility against that? What do I? How do I? Like, obviously, I'm just gonna have to make a stand once I'm just like, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not going to support this, but we don't. Um, I just want to say that I don't think it should matter like what race you are. I mean, I, I, I think that they should still be blaming like, the producers who just happen to be white. Because they, I feel like they know, they know the impact of what they're doing. Kind of more further on that and like kind of the question of like do artists have responsibility. I feel like someone has a responsibility to take care of people who take care of you. So, you know, if you have, you know, a lot of supporters who are black, you know, buying your records or, you know, white also, then you have a responsibility to not make their lives harder or make their image worse or, you know, it's your responsibility to, like, do whatever you can to, you know, improve the life of people who take care of you because, you know, that's what they're going to need. They made you successful, so you have a responsibility, you know, to make to help do whatever you can to help to bring them up and make them successful. Well, one of the, one of the counter arguments, you know, when, when Langston Hughes argues for the social responsibility of the black artist in particular, one of the counter arguments and from people like Zora Neale Hurston uh, was that uh, we need to be accurate in terms of describing what is. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that's our responsibility to be honest. Now, Maybe in a way you can have you can say that that um, some people in the public realm are not being responsible or honest. That is, they're they're putting forward a phony role, you know. And and to some degree, you can see that with Tupac. Uh, you know, to what degree <coughs> is he really <coughs> real in terms of being the thug? Mm -hmm. You know, here's here's a here's a guy who, yeah, he grew up poor, but he managed to go to a performing school to, for the arts. I mean, he, you, know, he, this, you know, he had a lot of advantages in his life um, and, and abilities in his life. And he was, you know, he didn't have to, to, he didn't have to make the choices he made after he became successful that got him into all the trouble. So maybe, maybe it's not just a choice of, um, you know, either honesty or responsibility. There are two images from the film that are stuck in my mind. One is the scene with the dolls, um, and the fact that he had to do that to put food on the table, you know what I mean, that kind of thing, just so he could survive, so he could give himself a chance as a performer before becoming an artist. And the other is um, in the music video Well, where did, did he have to do that? No. I mean, look, you know, <laughs> But he chose to yeah. as a way, as a means. To I mean, he's, he's a talented person. He, he you know, right. he had other choices. And the other thing that I wanted to point to was um, the music video where <clears throat> it's all in sepia. And, um, 
all of all the guys are sitting around the table when they get up, um, and they're strapped and everything. And it's it's interesting to me because, like like we said, he, he came from a privileged yet poor background. Um, privileged in the fact that like he had the start and, and education through the arts, um, and yet he wants to make himself hard and, and prove to the community that he's speaking to that he's one of them by using images like that. I feel. So, yeah. like, like we talked about earlier, you know, about how you know, how does he balance the positive songs that he made with like, the negative songs he made? Like, at least he's making positive songs. I mean, I feel like our <laughs> like our now hip hop nowadays we're just flooded, bombarded with you know killing and hoes, having sex, all that, and then we don't accentuate positives enough. You know the positive things that people do, the positive aspects, you know, of, of like you know hip hop and hip hop and black culture in America. Instead of just flooding it constantly with just negatives, and negatives, and you know because it sells, you know, because you know people yeah. from, we're just one one thing that one comparison I I've made in in public is is just the the notion of crack. You know that crack is a concentrated form of cocaine. Mm -hmm. And that, that really sells and is really effective, and you know, destroyed lots of lives, including lives of one of my brothers. And this, uh, when you think about it, certain kinds of music right now are kind of the equivalent of crack in the sense of very concentrated. And now they put it right close to your ear, and you know, you when you when you have negativity that close to your brain for many, many hours of the day, and especially when you're young and in your formative years, that can have a, an enormously destructive, it's, it's almost like we've got a delivery system through technology for delivering negative cultural messages that is unprecedented in human history. That, uh, and we'll see the result of it over, over time. Maybe just two final comments and then we'll have to. You mentioned that Zora Neale Hurston said that you know, artists sort of render their work in the way that they, that it currently exists. But like, I feel like he was able to do that with this song, Brenda's Got a Baby, right? Like, you still clearly saw the social conditions that contributed to her plight. At the same time, it was a constructive message. Yeah. So I think more of that, you know, should be out there than, and that still gets the point across that, you know, this is what currently exists. I'm, I'm seeing it the way it is, but this is where we need to go. And I think you had a thing. Oh, um, I just, because I think like even, you know, Lil Wayne has a perspective song or two on his album, but no one listens to it, I think. <laughs> and so I think that like, even, I, even you know, the most stereotypical minstrel show type rappers are self-aware, <laughs> but it's just sort of a vicious cycle. Well, actually, Step and Fetch It was, you know, privately very aware of you know, it was kind of surprising. That, and that's another aspect of performance, is that it doesn't represent who you really are. I think you, you haven't made any comment yet. Um, yeah, that was actually supposed to be my comment. Like, basically what I put, I put in social responsibility is like really portrayed in like, black feminist writing, where they show the reality of like, sexual abuse. And, like, and it might like, perpetuate the stereotype, but at the same time, she has like, the positive writings of, you know, Feminism and just like just the positive images of like the the ethnicity that needs to be shown out to the public. So. Well, there, there's, al there's always been the choice of people who want to make less money rather than lots of money. And you know, if you're talented, you can make you can have a. There's a lot of people right here in the Bay Area who make a career in the entertainment industry, and they do positive things. They're just not superstars. So, you know, that's part of, part of the choice. But maybe we'll continue this discussion. Uh, see you on Thursday for the last, uh, last session. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.